perfect. So hello and welcome. I am Lisa Carr, the Public Health Analyst um, with the External Engagement Team at SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Thank you for joining our webinar on mental health resources for faith-based and other community-based organizations. We're just so pleased that you have joined us here today. A few housekeeping announcements. Um, this is a webinar and you are welcome to send in your questions using the chat or Q&A function throughout the webinar. We will answer your questions after the presentations are done today. Um, this meeting is closed to the press and unauthorized recording is not permitted. And please note, this meeting is intended for invited leaders and guests from faith-based and community organizations, behavioral health, public health, and others engaged on mental health. All participants are muted and should be off camera except for the presenters. Now, today is the first day of our Faith Weekend of Action for Mental Health Awareness Month. Over the weekend and for the rest of May, we encourage you to share the Mental Health Awareness Month resource materials, particularly, particularly the ones that are faith-based. SAMHSA has created a faith-based weekend of action materials, and I will share more details with you um, during the webinar. We, I am joined by my colleague, Dobranyas, the, um, the team lead from the SAMHSA external engagement team. Thanks, Joe, for joining us today. We have three national faith leaders joining us. The first is the Reverend Dr. Sarah Lund. She's the Minister for Disabilities and Mental Health Justice at the United Church of Christ. Following Reverend Dr. Lund will be Ms. Carly Coons, Director of Education and Programming at the Blue Dove Foundation. And following Ms. Coons will be Dr. Ms. Ms. Laura Howe, Founder of Hope Made Strong and the Church Mental Health Summit. We will end our time together with a question and answer session. So if you have questions, please submit them in the chat or using the Q&A function. With that, I will quickly share some of the SAMHSA Faith Weekend of Action information. Perfect, thank you. Great, so if you go to the next slide, you'll see, let me tell you a little bit about SAMHSA. So, um, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, here's our mission and our what we envision. So our mission is to lead public health and service delivery efforts that pro promote mental health and prevent substance misuse and provide treatments and supports to foster recovery while ensuring equitable access and better outcomes. SAMHSA envisions that people with affected by or at risk for mental health and substance use conditions receive care, thrive, and achieve well-being. Now, if you go to the next slide, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and our Assistant Secretary of SAMHSA, Dr. Miriam Delphin Ritman, shared that um, the following in this web in that video. She shared that our country is facing an unprecedented mental health crisis across all ages and backgrounds. According to our data, nearly one in four adults reported a mental illness. Almost 20% of adolescents aged 12 to 17 had a major depressive episode. And tragically, there was one death every 11 minutes in the United States due to death by suicide. These troubling trends underscore that mental health matters at any age. At SAMHSA, we are committed to increasing access to mental health services. We also know that people are reluctant to get help. We want you to know that we see you, we hear you, and we support you. We believe that with right care, anyone affected by or at risk of a mental health condition can thrive, achieve well-being, and lead meaningful lives. And when healthy, you may also be a lifeline for someone else. We are sharing during Mental Health Awareness Month key resources and messages that can help those who are facing a mental health challenge. And if you clicked on the video of the Assistant Secretary on our website, you would hear this message. 
This slide shows the SAMHSA Mental Health Awareness Month website. It can be reached by going to SAMHSA, S-A-M-H-S-A dot G-O-V. That's also in, your, in the chat. Um, and you can click on the Mental Health Awareness Month. Mental Health Awareness Month started in 1949. We have a video from the Assistant Secretary and a Presidential Proclamation, which happens every year. Now, if you go to the next slide, if you, scroll, if you were to scroll down on the website, you'd find the Mental Health Awareness Month Toolkit, along with an event taking place today, Friday, that is being live streamed. A list of other events with the recordings is further down on this website. Now, if you go to the next slide, this is the content of the Mental Health Awareness Month Toolkit. Uh, we hope that you will use the social media posts that is such an easy thing to do to like and share our posts. Go to samsa.gov or use those posts and just post them on your page, whatever works for you. Um, you can do use the uh, like and share them from your organization account or from your personal account. And if you're not the social media person in your organization, um, we please share the toolkit with them so they can share this information. Even if you can't share social media posts this weekend, Anytime in May or even throughout the year is a good time to share information on mental health. Now, if you go to the next page, the SAMHSA Mental Health Awareness Month Toolkit includes hashtag guidance. And we welcome you using the hashtag in the hashtag MHAM2024 with your posts. Um, when you do that, all of your uh, all of the posts will be counted. Um, on our metrics towards Mental Health Awareness Month, and you'll be joining virtually with others. We have stickers, virtual backgrounds, email signatures, and even tips for engaging in respectful conversations around mental health. Now, if you go to the next slide, you'll see our this is our Faith Weekend of Action materials. We have bulletin inserts in English and Spanish. Um, we have a short faith leader announcements, and talking points. You can use this material in your congregation or your community orga organization this weekend um, in the month of May and throughout the year. Please tag us so that you can join with others in doing outreach on this issue. Now, if you go to the next slide, you'll say here, here's the faith leader announcement, which highlights 988, which is our suicide and crisis lifeline, that is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, by chat, text, and by phone. Special support is available for veterans, for LGBTQIA plus youth who have a higher rate of death by suicide, and we have assistance available in Spanish and for individuals who are deaf and hard of hearing. Find support.gov and findtreatment.gov are two government websites that provide information on where to find help and find treatment for mental health and substance use disorders. We also have talking points for faith leaders to share on spreading acceptance and support. Now, if you go to the next page, you'll see um, here are talking points on encouraging people um, to seek help if they need it and talking points on focusing on hope and supporting one another. Faith leaders may want to share this information and key resources during May and beyond. Now, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that SAMHSA has a website for faith-based organizations. Just Google the word SAMHSA and faith and up will show this, this page. Now, if you go to the next slide, you will see um, information on our mental, mater, maternal mental health task forces national strategy to improve maternal mental health care. This report was released just this week on Tuesday. The U.S. has the highest maternal mortality rate among high-income countries. Deaths from suicide, drug overdoses, and other causes related to mental health and substance use issues are the leading, leading cause of pregnancy-related deaths in the United States. An estimated one in five individuals 
are impacted by mental health conditions and substance use disorders during pregnancy and the postpartum period. And Black and American Indian, Alaska Native individuals and others in under-resourced communities are disproportionately impacted. To view the full report, go to samhsa.gov. Now, if you go to the next slide, here is my contact information. I'm the faith-based lead here at SAMHSA. Please do not hesitate to reach out to me um, regarding faith outreach. I will now turn the webinar over to the Reverend Dr. Dr. Sarah Lund. Thank you so much, Lisa and all the partners and friends at SAMHSA. This is a wonderful opportunity for all of us to come together to utilize a resource that we have in every community the resource of faith. And so I'm speaking to you as a person of faith. I'm a pastor, I'm an author, I'm an advocate. I'm a person in recovery uh, with my own mental health conditions and I am a suicide loss survivor. And so I invite you to do what you can to join this movement for mental health. The World Health Organization says that mental health is a human right. And as a faith leader, I say that mental health is a God-given right. And so, Wherever you are located and whatever your faith might be, I encourage you to do something this weekend as we are encouraging people to show up and speak up for mental health. I'd like to share some slides with you to encourage you, giving you an example of what our organization is doing, the United Church of Christ. We have a network called the Mental Health Network. It's a national network, and we created this resource that has been a tool that we invite you to use, adapt, and share. This is called the Welcoming, Inclusive, Supportive, and Engaged, or WISE, for mental health. This is a program that's been used by synagogues, churches, nonprofits, associations, and conferences across the country. And we've also consulted with people in other uh, parts of the world who are interested in a program that allows your organization to focus on mental health. And so I'd like to share with you the different parts about the WISE program. Next slide. The United Church of Christ is a denomination in the United States. We have a million members, 5,000 churches across the country, and our core values believes in this invitation to create a just world for all. And so we include disability and mental health justice as part of our core values. We're also open and affirming, celebrating God's love for all people. And so you'll see our Love is Louder logo if you want to learn more about that go to ucc.org. But I wanted to share, especially in the context of faith and mental health, that we take a sensitive approach to issues in our faith communities that may be a diverse range of views. But knowing that in the mental health field, we see a high risk of suicide among the LGBTQ community. And so we, as faith leaders, have an extra responsibility and obligation to do no harm. Next slide. So in our WISE program, we encourage you to think about becoming welcoming in whatever faith context you are. Welcoming means you're creating an environment where people with mental health systems and their fam families feel welcomed. So one example of this is supporting a mental health ministry team that would begin to understand what are the symptoms and diagnoses that you're seeing in your community. And we have found over and over again, the key barrier to welcome is stigma. Stigma is the sense of shame that there's something wrong with us because of our mental health condition. And in faith communities, there can be additional stigma because of religious teachings, the way we interpret sacred text. And so it's important as faith communities that we embrace what science is teaching us about our beautiful brains and that having a mental health condition is not something that's um, a sin or evil or um, a punishment from God, but it's simply what it means to be human. And so if we can encourage faith communities to destigmatize mental health by understanding what science can teach us, that will help in a faith context. So 
Reducing stigma is a key effort in the WISE program. Next slide. As we continue to looking at WISE, welcoming, inclusive, supportive, engage, inclusive means that mental health and people with brain differences are included in the life of the church. When we've taught about WISE in other areas, some people will say, well, if we become a WISE church, then all those people will start coming. And what we realize is those people are us. Those people with mental health conditions are already in the church. And so by being inclusive, you can name that. And that's part of breaking the silence. So for this Sunday, if you're going to have a mental health Sunday, include mental health in your prayers. And if you know families or people in your congregation that are willing to share about their mental health diagnosis, that is so powerful. We can break the silence in worship. So I encourage you to designate a Sunday that's your mental health Sunday. In the United Church of Christ, it's always the third Sunday of May. But as I like to say, every Sunday is mental health Sunday. Next slide. So in addition to being welcoming and inclusive, we encourage you to be supportive. Support people with mental health symptoms and their families. Don't forget about the families. We are all connected and we are all impacted by mental health. One way you can support folks is to create a spiritual support group for mental health. We've done this in our church and it's a simple way to create a space where families and friends can share their stories and a faith-based setting that is safe. This is what we call providing the casserole to those who might be experiencing mental health symptoms, whether at home, in a mental health care center or hospital. Mental illness has been seen as a no casserole illness. We don't think of bringing people a meal when they're struggling with depression, can't get out of bed, just feeling overwhelmed and not able to make dinner for their families. I've worked with families and they are so relieved to know that there's a plan to bring a cooked dinner over to their home so that they can feel cared for. And so as a supportive congregation or community, uh, we can wrap people around with our arms of love and support. The last part of WISE is engaged. So on the next slide, you'll look at how you can be welcoming, inclusive, supportive, and engaged. And this means outreach, continue to educate your community, but also look at how you can connect to community partners. You can host a community forum that invites partners to come and educate your community, but also see what are the other folks in your area, your community, your state doing about mental health. And most of all, be a mental health advocate. Mental health is for everybody. And it is something that we need to speak up about and help people get the support and resources they need. So there's a quick review of 10 steps that we offer to become wise, and this can be adapted. But basically, you want to ask your leadership to be supportive of becoming wise, form a team that can work on this together, let the UCC Mental Health Network know that you're doing this process and they have a consultant that can help you. Create a plan and approach that focuses on education. We believe that education is a key element to addressing the stigma that can lead to your organization voting to become wise. Then draft a wise covenant. Involve your leadership in engaging with this wise covenant. Vote on your wise covenant. And then certify by letting the Mental Health Network know that you're wise and celebrate. Publicize that you are wise with your community and then think about the future. Now that you're committed to mental health, what might you be called to do next? In the next slide, I wanted to give you an example of covenant. This is something that in our tradition, it's a promise that we make. It's a part of our vision about who we are. And so here's an example of one organization's covenant. They say, in an effort to reduce social stigma, we plan, we pledge to examine our own attitudes and preconceived notions about mental health symptoms, and we confront our own ingrained stigma. We pledge to actively welcome those with mental health realities into our faith community, and provide a safe environment in which people can tell their stories and share their journeys. Next slide. 
We pledge to include people with mental health symptoms in the life, work, and leadership of the congregation. We commit to recruiting, nominating, supporting persons with mental health realities to serve on teams in leadership positions within the congregation. And when calling clergy and other staff, we pledge to be open to hiring persons with mental health diagnoses. You can see why a covenant is so powerful. And if your organization takes time to be educated and make a commitment to mental health, it can really shape how your organization approaches mental health as part of its core identity and commitment. So in summary, when we think about whys, I want to encourage you to join this global movement to break the silence as people of faith and partners in the faith community, do all that you can to end the stigma and tell the stories, put a human face onto something that affects all of us. And in the faith community, we can share hope because we believe that together we can shine a light in the shadows and connect one another so that no one feels alone and everyone knows they are unconditionally loved. I wanted to share some contact information. We'd love to work with you. The UCC Mental Health Network has worked with synagogues and other denominations and other nonprofits. Check out the website, www.mhn.ucc.org. There's my name and my email and my website for further information. Thank you so much again for all that you do to help end the stigma around mental health challenges. Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Lund. We're so glad you could be with us today. Um, I will now turn the webinar over to Carly Coons, Director of Education and Programming at the Blue Dove Foundation. Carly? Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, and Reverend Dr. Lund, so much of what you spoke about today really resonates with the work we do at Blue Dove. So I think you'll all see some overlaps, which is, brings me a lot of joy. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Can you all see that okay? Excellent. Um, so my name is Carly. I am a licensed social worker and a Jewish educator. Um, I really found my career at this intersection of mental health and working within the Jewish community. Um, I work for an organization called the Blue Dove Foundation. We um, were founded in 2018 to address mental illness and addiction in the Jewish community and beyond. So being in these interfaith spaces as well is really important to us. We are focused on education, awareness, and outreach, um, really thinking about how do we approach mental health education through a Jewish lens? How can we use Judaism to help us better understand and talk about and support mental health using text and holidays and values um, and through that, we provide workshops and trainings, we create content, uh, we connect with the community, doing talks like this and running programs. And it has been a busy month for us with uh, Mental Health Awareness Month this month. Um, we've done seven programs already, so we have just had a really great time outreaching to the community. Um, so in true Jewish educator fashion, uh, I can't in good faith talk without doing a little bit of learning. Um, and actually this relates so well to what um, Reverend Dr. Lund was talking about. Um, the Blue Dog Foundation has eight mental health me dote, which is the Hebrew word for values. Um, and these values are really what we ground our work in. And so this particular value I love so much, it's B'Tselem Elohim, which translates to created in God's image. And it comes from the Torah, it comes from Genesis. And it's this passage that says, and God said, let us make humankind in our image after our likeness. They shall rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the cattle, the whole earth, and all the creeping things that creep on earth. And God created humankind in God's image. And it's really this idea that when we approach um, we approach each other and we support each other the way that we've created, not only does it create this inclusive environment, but if we view it as we were created the way in which we were meant to be created, think about how beautiful the world is when we have all of those things together. And when we treat people with that dignity and respect, we can counter the shame and stigma that surrounds mental illness and addiction. 
So really in line with what we've been talking about today. Um, so the Blue Div, we, we have a bunch of the content we create, we call them resources, but just to make sure we're all talking about the same thing, there's, we hear the word resources all the time. So what is a resource? Um, a mental health resource might refer to the professional or formal resources that we are engaging with, whether that's individual, group, family therapy, maybe it's medication or a rehabilitation facility, but that's the more formal or professional help that we can receive to support us. Crisis resources, like Lisa was talking about, like 988, are the resources we can use in an instance where we are struggling with a crisis, we're concerned about somebody, or we are calling with or texting with somebody who is experiencing a crisis to make sure that they get the support they need. And then when we talk about the Blue Dove Foundation resources, what I'm referring to are the activity-based learning that we provide and that we have hosted on our website that are free for people to use and engage with. So we're going to dive into these a little bit more to see how we approach this. So the Blue Dove Foundation resources pair together Jewish and mental health learning with an activity to solidify that learning. Uh, it's a way to make these connections in a meaningful and hands-on way. And as I mentioned before, we're really thinking about how do we connect to the things that people already are familiar and comfortable with? How can we connect it to our holidays, our traditions, our values, our text, and everything in between as something to sort of help us have that conversation. So for each holiday, uh, and there are so many holidays in Judaism. So for each holiday, we have a slate of resources that make these connections and sort of normalize the fact that we can talk about mental health at any time during the year. And when we take a look at our historical figures and at our texts, when you really look at it, mental health is sprinkled in for everything we do, even in the Torah, right? We see it even in Genesis with B'Tselem Elohim, this idea that we are meant to be the way that we were created and that's what brings this, the beauty to this world. Um, we also want to help people remember that they do not need to be a mental health professional to support mental health or to use these resources. Our goal is to make them really accessible so that anybody feels comfortable taking and using them and reminding people that we are the best observers in our community to see when somebody is struggling and to know when something feels off about the people we care about so that we can check in with them and make sure that they're getting the support that they need. So how are these resources structured? This is a, a little look into our one of our Hanukkah resources, the Mental Health Menorah. The Menorah or the Hanukkah is a symbol that we use during Hanukkah, the eight days of Hanukkah, where you progressively light a candle each night um, and you end with all of this beauty of the light. Um, and so in this, you can see there's a little bit of grounding in the story of Hanukkah, in the story of the Maccabees and the resilience that they had to um, protect the Jewish people. And then there's a little bit of mental health learning. What is resilience? How do we understand that? That's a word in particular that's kind of a buzzword right now. So helping us learn about that with then an activity to actually engage in that and think for ourselves, what are the things that make us resilient? What are the things that provide us strength? Uh, when we are feeling like we might need that support. So how do you use these Blue Dev resources? We have many ways. The first is we encourage people to use them on their own to support their own mental health. Um, we oftentimes forget about ourselves in a community where we are so good at supporting others. So for individuals, for clergy, for youth leaders, for camp directors, we encourage people to use it on their own. We also encourage people to share it out with their communities, to put it in their newsletters, host them on their website. Um, there's a JCC in California that prints them out for every holiday and puts them in their holiday baskets that community members pick up and take home. So lots of ways to engage with it. We also encourage group facilitation uh, to facilitate these in a religious school classroom in an adult education setting with your youth group um, at a summer camp, sort of anything in between, and really taking and adapting these resources to meet the needs of your community. And, um, you know, we have very little ego around it. We just want people to be using the content and learning together. And and as that's adapting it to meet the needs of the people uh, around you. All of our resources are 
in our resource library on the Blue Dove Foundation's website. And that website I just put in the chat. Um, you can search for a specific topic in the search bar here. On the side, you can toggle based on a holiday, based on a mental health diagnosis, based on a category. If you want to see a meditation, you can look up audiovisual. So there's lots of ways to navigate it. And we're always um, increasing those resources as well. And we hope that you stay connected to us at the Blue Dove Foundation. There's many ways to engage with us on um, Instagram, Facebook, emailing us or our website. Um, and uh, we hope that you find these resources helpful and useful. And we are just so grateful to be doing this work with you all. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carly. That was so helpful. And you all should have that uh, ch in, the, the, in your chat. You can see that program. Um, I will now turn uh, the webinar over to Laura Howe, founder of Hope Made Strong and the Church Mental Health Summit. Welcome, Laura. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me all right? I think I'm off mute. Fantastic. I love this. I'm learning so much. It's so great to connect with all of you. It has been a wonderful afternoon so far. Yes, give up the, go on the emojis, put the hearts and the claps in. Yeah, I love this. So much fun. I have the honor and privilege to uh, lead Hope Made Strong and produce the Church Mental Health Summit along with some amazing partners. And so today I want to walk through some of the resources that we offer at Hope Made Strong. Uh, we'll start off here. I'll share my slide here. Here we go. So let's start off looking at um, what we do on a whole. And then we're going to zero in on two resources that you can use tomorrow, next week, next month or next year, like Lisa said, and I think a couple of people have said, you know, every day is a great day to celebrate mental health and to honor mental health, bring awareness to it. So at Hope Made Strong, we support churches to develop care ministries that are sustainable and strategic. I truly believe that the local congregation is a perfect place. It's perfectly designed to be in the hearts of our community and connected to our neighbors and to the community at large. Uh, Carly said this, we as faith leaders and organizational leaders, we hear the heartbeat and are in close connection and relationship with those in our community. So we are often the first people that uh, those go to who are struggling. You know, I personally, I go to my friends and the family and my loved ones and those who I trust first when I'm struggling, maybe not so much a doctor that I barely know or have to book an appointment with or might cost me money. No, I go to my friends and family and in the church and in congregations, we are the friends and family for many, many people. And so it just makes sense that we are the people that uh, decrease stigma, that are on a mission to help support, wrap our arms around people when they are struggling, be cheerleaders and walk alongside someone as they journey through to recovery. So at Hope Made Strong, I'm excited to offer the Care Ministry cohort as well as the Care Ministry podcast. These are two resources that are more have a broader view of what uh, a care ministry and what congregations are able to offer. Church Mental Health Summit and Mental Health Sunday, we're going to be talking about that just today. And then we have a few online courses. But let's start off talking about the, um, the, where is it? Here we go. The Mental Health Sunday. So this is our third year hosting the Mental Health Sunday toolkit. So if you're watching this webinar, click over to another tab, click, go www.mentalhealthsunday.com and you're going to be able to see the resource there when you can download this. What the goal is for this resource is to give you the tools you need to make talking about mental health at your church on a Sunday morning easy. Because when we're talking with congregations or we're talking with ministry leaders, people are often overwhelmed with the thought, okay, how am I going to talk about mental health on a Sunday morning? Uh, because Sunday morning or, or within a service, there's a totally different vibe happening. There's a lot uh, it's a different approach. It's not a it's not a webinar like this. It's not a lecture like a classroom or a or a one oh one workshop. There's just a different inspirational message. So how do we integrate mental health into our faith community within the conversation of that uh, key service uh, for Sunday morning? And so uh, this is what we are what we have done because when people ask how do we do it, well. Number one way that you can decrease stigma in your church is 
to talk about it. And what better way than on a Sunday morning? And so the theme this year, we've done this three years. And so our theme this year is you are more than. And so we did have a video that we were going to play, but it's not working. So I'm just going to explain where the concept of you are more than and why is there a picture on a box on this screen that totally does not make sense. But one of the, a few months ago, I was having a down day because we all have mental health, right? Mental health is not, uh, is, is health. Mental health is health. So we are, have good mental health and poor mental health and it's a continuum and it flexes between. And so on one of the days that I was having a down day, it was a rough day and I had to go pick up some stuff from my friend's house. And I can't remember, it was probably leftover dishes from a potluck because I always leave something behind. And she put it in a box and I put it in the passenger seat of my car, walked around the car and got in the driver's seat. And when I went to back out, I saw on the box, I, um, I am more than just a box. And it hit me that I, if this box can be more than a box, because as a kid, it could be a spaceship, it could be a fort, it could be a slide, you know, a, a, a slide or, you know, whatever. A box could be so many things. And if that box could be more than a box, how much more am I a child of God, a precious gift that God has given, right? I, I, I'm more than my mistakes. I am more than my diagnosis. I am more than what people say I am. And this concept that you are more than what you are more than, and you could just fill in the blank, was this idea of like, this would be such an incredible way that you can talk about mental health in a Sunday morning context that God has created you just as we've heard in a designed you knit to knit you together in such a way that there you are more than your diagnosis. You are more than what people said you are. You are more than your past and you are more than your mistakes. And so we have designed a toolkit that helps you develop all of these um, resources that you would need for church. So in this, we have promotional uh, video, we have social media, we have slides, we have their sermon notes. Uh, there's invitations. We even created a five-day devotional that you can download and share with your team. There's a small group, a link to a small group curriculum, and then there's 12 monthly ideas on how you can continue the conversation ongoing in your church. And here's an example of the social media for this um, particular theme. Now, we don't want you to cookie cutter care cannot be cookie cutter. It has to be as unique as your congregation, your culture, and your community. So we invite you to download these as templates, then adapt them and change them so the context of your community. So when it says, will you come with me, Mental Health Sunday, this someone did this on March 24th, but you can do this on May 24th or October 24th or whenever you need it because this is adaptable for your community. So we invite you to download the toolkit, Mental Health Sunday, so that you are able to start talking about mental health because that really is the first, first step in decreasing stigma. The second resource that I want to share with you from Hope Made Strong is the Church Mental Health Summit. We have completed four summits in the past, uh, in, in the past, so once a year, our annual summit, and it's on October 10th. And last year, we had registrations close to 11,000 people, 10,800 people registered for the summit across 125 countries. We feature uh, speakers, thought leaders, those with lived experience, educators, pastors, all everyone that you could think of uh, has offers a talk or a session from all different denominations. We're ecumenical, we are global. And so this really gives you an opportunity to register for a free training on October 10th uh, and gather your team, you know, have a watch party, viewing party. So churchmentalhealthsummit.com uh, and you can access all of that on October 10th for free. So I think that's it for me. We, uh, churchmentalhealthsummit.com and then the uh, Mental Health Sunday. So thank you everyone for stepping up, for having courage to say we want to champion mental health in our community. We are here with you. If you ever need to reach out, please do with any of our panelists. We're here to support you as 
as you navigate that and as you uh, champion mental health in your community. Thank you so much, Laura. That was just every, all these, I'm just so thrilled with all these presenters and such great information. And thanks for the, the love through the emojis as well. That's <laughs> wonderful. Um, and, and we intentionally made all of the materials are available for free, including on October 10th, that conference. Uh, it's an amazing conference and uh, nice that we have so much free materials. Um, we'll now go ahead and take any questions that folks may have. Feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A function, um, and we would be glad to take any of your questions. I'd like to share that we also have some Mental Health Sunday worship resources. I'm going to put them in the chat. Uh, this was a toolkit that we created in partnership with the United Church of Canada. And so there's sample sermon messages, children's messages, prayers, uh, litanies, suggested hymns. And so it's uh, something that you can download for free and use in your communities as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Great. Um, we did get the question, um, will, will there will a recording of this presentation be available? Um, yes, I do. Uh, we do hope to share the recording. Um, we also will have the PowerPoints and available and we'll share them all uh, with everyone who RSVP'd. So thank you, Carla, for that question. Um, we also have another question um, from Elise um, and it's, uh, do you consider all neurological conditions when you think about mental health, like Parkinson's, dementia, TBIs, ETC. Do any of our panelists wanna take that? I can speak to it briefly and uh, not as a clinician. Uh, that sounds like a more technical question, uh, but as someone with lived experience of loved ones with other neurological conditions that oftentimes they impact mental health. So uh, sometimes uh, other disabilities can cause more anxiety and depression simply because you're navigating care and symptoms that cause pain, can cause feelings of being overwhelmed, can impact your energy, impact your ability to engage in the life um, that you used to live. So there's loss and grief with that. And so in that sense, I would say very much so people who have other diagnoses on their mental health is directly impacted by that. I would add to that absolutely that our mental health and our physical health are intrinsically connected to one another. Um, we live in one body and when one is struggling, it impacts the other. So if we are struggling with our mental health, we might see some physical symptoms um, and vice versa. If we're struggling with our physical health, we're likely to see some mental health symptoms as well. So I think, especially as we are, are trying to approach mental health holistically, it's really thinking about everybody has mental health. Everybody might have days that they struggle, whether or not they have a diagnosed mental illness, we still have mental health um, and sort of approaching it from that way and then bringing everybody in and bringing inclusive, regardless of what that struggle is, not gatekeeping that care, but saying, regardless of what your struggle is, we wanna care for your mental health. Thank you, that's wonderful. Uh, we have a couple more questions. Um, uh, we see Cynthia said, thank you so much for these wonderful presentations. This is fabulous. She's wondering if there's a way to incorporate both mental health and substance use in education, dissemination, resources, ETC. And if so, how have you done that? Done this? I'll just say for SAMHSA, um, we have a faith-based and community newsletter, and we put lots of our resources around mental health and substance use disorders in the newsletter. Um, I'm updating the website, but it's information's there as well. Um, and we'll continue to do outreach around um, specific commemorative dates around uh, substance use uh, disorders. So um, I appreciate that and we'll continue to keep that in mind. I wonder if anyone else has any comments, great. Yes, um, in the United Church of Christ, we also believe in uh, God's love for people who use drugs and who have substance use and addictions. And so we have a minister for harm reduction and overdose prevention. And I'm sharing with you all in the chat a resource to those materials. And we're going to designate a harm reduction Sunday 
and provide worship aids and worship materials there. And so uh, that's really part of the heart of this work is to share love, not judgment. And so I think the theme that links substance use and addiction to mental health is the stigma. Stigma and shame isolate us. And so what we can do as faith communities is build that bond of connection and love that is not judgmental or stigmatizing, uh, but simply creates space for everyone to show up and share their stories about what they're really living with. Thank you so much. In the work with Hope Made Strong, uh, when we talk about care ministry, we definitely address uh, addictions, whether it's behavioral or substance or or, or whatnot. And absolutely mental health and addictions are intertwined and uh, see the, like uh, Reverend Dr. Sarah said that it is, they are definitely connected and we want to approach it with the same grace, the same compassion, the same levels of support. Um, on the Care Ministry podcast, we often talk about addictions uh, and have uh, within the context of, of care for churches. So definitely important. One of the things that Blue, the Blue Dog Foundation has been doing this month is um, providing Narcan trainings for Jewish communal professionals. Um, so we've offered two already. We've trained um, about 150 people. We have a third one coming up just for May. Um, and I think what has been so impactful, uh, the way we're approaching it, we're partnering with Be Well through the Jewish Federations of North America and Sela, which is a re Jewish recovery organization based in New York. Um, and grounding it in Jewish learning and, and taking that time to really say, why does this important? Why is this important to us in the Jewish community? Um, and I think the beauty between, you know, doing a little bit of tech study and then engaging in the learning around opioids and fentanyl and how to use Narcan or naloxone um, is so powerful. And I think that is such a great way educationally to break down some of this stigma by bringing in our religious pieces of text, connecting them directly to mental illness and addiction and saying, we can talk about both of these in the same space. Um, and so we really encourage other faith communities uh, to do this as well. We also encourage anybody to join us who don't have to be Jewish to come to these trainings. So um, they're always open and welcome. I love that, Carly. If I can just add, I think that is the work of our faith community is to um, reinterpret what has um, historically been harmful uh, teachings that have harmed and caused stigma. And we're in a space now where we can destigmatize. For example, Dr. Sonia Waters talks about addiction and she says people who are addicted are people who are hurting. And so it's not the addiction that is the sin, it is the systems that cause the pain and the hurt. For example, racism and discrimination. Those are the systems that create pain for people that then they use to address their pain. And so that different way of understanding addictions and people's pain can liberate us and make our hearts open and judgment-free so that we can truly partner with people and change the systems um, that are causing pain. And that's part of the advocacy work of mental health justice. Thank you so much. That was that leads right into our our last uh, or one of our last questions here. It says, "How does mental health justice interconnect to other social justice connections like economic justice, racial justice, gender justice, peace and justice, social determinants of health, and trauma prevention?" Seem to be a part of our mental health awareness. I know in the new um, focus on suicide prevention, the report that's come out in the call that all of us do what we can to prevent suicide, there's additional focus on diversity, on a lethal means. And so when we think about people of color who are at higher risk, um, we know it's because our society creates so much more barriers to accessing resources. Um, there's cultural ways that we uh, stigmatize people and all of the other challenges with um, economics. And um, for the LGBTQ community, if you're a person of color and LGBTQ, there are additional layers of discrimination. And so um, the more that a faith community can help educate right, around diversity, equity, and inclusion from a lens of love that we are all human, we all are equal, 
worthy of respect and care, uh, that goes a long way to create this sense of belonging and connection that we know helps prevent suicide. I think in um, the Jewish community, we have such an incredible focus on social justice. The value of tikkun olam, of repairing the world, is so embedded uh, in the cultural and the religious side of the community. And I think in a lot of ways, um, the, the justice for mental health, the inclusion of mental health can actually really take a page out of some of the other work that, um, that we are already doing, right? The way that Judaism is supportive of the environment, the way that Judaism has found a way to, and is working to continue to support the LGBTQ plus community, right? What does that look like for us to also pull in um, that mental health piece, knowing that with climate change, the the we have a lot of mental health impacts from that. There's a lot of chronic stress created and anxiety around that. The LGBTQ community is at higher risk for um, mental health challenges because of the systems and structures set up in our society. So when we are supporting those, we are also supporting mental health. And if we can bring that mental health into those conversations, it makes it makes that justice work that much more meaningful. I think we're we become we're past the point where the church is or, or faith communities and congregations are 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 just taking care of the spiritual life. I think there's a, a an awakening and a realization that our congregations and our and our faith communities impact multiple layers of people's well-being, whether they're their self-care, their community care, their spiritual care, their their clinical support, and then the social aspect. And 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 I love that I, I'm hearing and seeing and thank you for the question mark on 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 how can we take this a next step? What is the responsibility and the role of our faith communities in addressing some of these? Because we have a, a place to we have we have a role to play we have a a voice that's important and I think um and, and I'm excited to see what's coming next and and where the next generation and and where the momentum is moving towards where our faith congregations are stepping up and saying no this is important we're going to stand and we are here for you and 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 you know standing for justice and 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 helping people recover and overcome and be safe communities where people re can recover and overcome from trauma and so it's quite exciting and um i'm i'm honored to be in this conversation i'd love to give an example of what we're talking about with um, how churches can be more than tending to the spiritual care here in indianapolis the black church coalition has worked together to organize the community to respond to the opportunity that 988 has, right? A, a number to call. Well, we also want um, someone to come and to help and a safe place to go. And as we know for the black community, there is a history of some fear around calling 911 for help. And so we've created a mobile crisis team that's trained around diversity, equity, and inclusion, trained around how to interact with people who are in a mental health crisis so that it's safe for everyone. And a lot of that um, energy and momentum and organizing happened from the faith community. These are faith leaders who went into their congregations and, and cast a vision. And they were able to rally around this and really make a positive difference in their community. And so never underestimate the power of a small group of faithful people, even two or three people to dream and imagine uh, the good that is possible when we work together. Wonderful, thank you so much, uh, Reverend Dr. Lund. That was really helpful to hear. Uh, we're so excited about the possibilities that our, uh, the faith community can be engaged in. And we thank you all for, for sharing your wisdom today on the webinar. Looks like we got one more question in. Um, great. Oh, but just a comment that our uh, Lisa uh, shared that um, a comment that our churches are focused on the total being faith, fitness, finance, and family. And under fitness includes physical, emotional, mental, and social fitness. So thank you, Lisa, for sharing that. 
Great. Well, we've come close to the end of our time today. Uh, I will be sending out the PowerPoints um, and hopefully the recording to everybody uh, that RSVP'd for this webinar. Um, for, uh, we do uh, thank you for all who attended the webinar today, and we look forward to having you attend a future SAMHSA webinar. To stay connected on SAMHSA faith-based uh, engagement, please sign up for the SAM for the faith-based newsletter. Um, the link will be in the chat, um, but you can also find it on our main website at samhsa.gov and just scroll to the bottom of the page there. Um, we thank you for, uh, for, for all of the amazing speakers today. We are so blessed by your wisdom. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Um, and this does conclude the end of our webinar. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Goodbye.